Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you here with us as we continue our series on the Upper Room, the Church of the Upper Room. This is a series which is where we, we talk about church, but we're really talking about what church is about. That's actually what we're taking the time to do. And this is a series that we've been doing over a number of messages throughout the year. But before we move forward in that, I just want to take the opportunity to pray for someone in our congregation. So Dorothy Manwaring, uh, you often see Dorothy pushing her frame around here at church. Uh, she had a fall and she broke a couple of ribs and she had to be taken to hospital and the poor thing, she's been moved out of ICU, but she's on the ward now and um, she needs our prayers. So let's pray for her. Heavenly Father, we pray for Dorothy. Lord, we pray for your healing hand upon her, your hand of strength. Lord, we pray for her to know your presence right now. May she know that even now as she pauses to think about the fact that she's not here this morning, that she would know that you are with her. Lord, we thank you that this is the reality, that wherever we are and whatever situation we're in, you are with us, even to the end of the age. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I mentioned, uh, we've been thinking about the church, and we've been trying to get a hold of this idea of the church of the upper room. Now, I'll show you this diagram. This is a diagram that we've had a couple of times up when we've looked at this. And what we've noticed is that in church... There's a few things that people become attached to. There's things that sort of draw them into church. And those aspects are things like uh, the place, the fact that it's a place where they feel comfortable, a place which maybe has the facilities that they're after or it's in the location they want. There are people that they connect with, they're their kind of people. There are personalities within that church that they connect with and they might connect with a personality in the leadership there's also the what's the fourth p place personality people yeah and programs and that's often a big one is the programs that people get connected to but here's the thing is that while they are an important part an active part of being a community of people you can find those things in all sorts of communities that's not actually what makes a church a church. It is a part of the life of the church. But in reality, what church is about is what goes on in what we're calling the upper room space. See, down in the lower room, there's all sorts of activities and relationships that happen. But it's the relationship with Jesus that makes church, church. It's that relationship with Jesus that actually brings about a change in someone's life. And we see that it's in the upper room where people connected with Jesus, where Jesus drew his disciples together, where he shared himself with them, where, in fact, he shared his Holy Spirit with them. And from the upper room, they broke out into Jerusalem. And we saw the church, the early church was born. So we're focusing on church, or we're talking about what church is about, really. Because the focus is never about church, is it? The focus is about Jesus. Now... I wanted to present you with a phrase which I've often heard people use. It's from the Westminster Confession, and it was developed in 1646. And it says this, Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So, I'd like you to have a look at that phrase, and then take a moment to say hello to the person next to you and share with them your answer to this question. From this statement, what appears to be the priority of the church? So the statement was, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. From that statement, what appears to be the priority of the church? Go ahead and share that with the person next to you. (laughs) 
Okay, so as you look at that statement, it's pretty obvious that it's a statement about worship. It's a statement about worshiping God, and it's a statement that appears quite glorious. It's quite majestic. It sounds right. It sounds spiritual. The only thing is, it's not really the emphasis that Jesus has in the Gospels. See, he only talks about worshipping God or about people worshipping God twice in the Gospels. Once, when he's talking with the Samaritan woman and he's talking about worshipping God in spirit and in truth. And secondly, sounding much like Amos, the prophet that we looked at last week, Jesus says this in Mark chapter 7, verse 6 to 8. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Unfortunately, the human act of worship, particularly in a religious setting or in religious mode in our lives, quickly becomes about an experience of worship instead of an expression of worship. It becomes an occasional tradition that we do, even if it's a contemporary tradition that we do, rather than a lifestyle that we live. See, the reality is that it's not that worship isn't good, it's just not the chief end that Jesus set for his community of disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, after Jesus had risen and as he was about to ascend, these years. Last words before leaving planet Earth, he says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, same question now. After thinking about that passage, that phrase that Jesus left with his disciples from that statement, what appears to be the priority of the church? From that statement, what appears to be the priority of the church? Go ahead and tell the person next to you. All right, so if you came up with something like mission or helping people follow Jesus, then it seems that you're pretty much on track with what it was that Jesus was saying to his disciples. It seems that he sees the goal of the church, the goal of a church of the upper room, not as worship, but as mission. The priority is not worship but mission. Here's your mission, he says. Go and baptize, include into the family of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. In his book, Future Church, Will Mancini writes this. He says, this is where you have to begin. Because if you start with a culture of mission, you get worshippers. But if you start with a culture of worship, you get worship services. So here's the first point. If you're following along in the sermon notes today, number one, mission is the action of making disciples. Mission is the action of making disciples. Not the intent, but the action of making disciples. We've often focused on this idea. Make worship services better and you'll get better disciples. That's often what we focused on. But that doesn't really work, does it? In fact, what we saw was that as we've gone into the 20th century, with all the great worship services that we've held, we've seen more and more people deconstructing their faith and drifting away from churches. 
15 years ago, the most influential church in the US, a church called Willow Creek Church, did a survey of its people. And what they found was that spiritual growth was not primarily from worship services. It actually came from three other things. It came from regular Bible reading, prayerful Bible reading. It came from small groups that connected and it came from serving other people. Church services were seen to be a primary influence to begin with, but they then went on to become a secondary influence as people found that they needed a relational connection, a relational connection with people and a relational connection with Jesus himself, which can only be found in the context of what we're talking about in this series, upper room spirituality, gathering with others in order to grow in relational closeness with Jesus. The focus on worship services created such a gravitational pull around Sundays that the focus of the church's resources and its attention became all about an event rather than the actual process of disciple making. In fact, by the beginning of the 21st century, the Sunday worship service had reached such prominence that one well-known Australian church became the first organisation on the continent, secular or Christian, to purchase a $2 million sound mixer. The Sunday service can become so big. This idea that make worship services, make them better, make them bigger, and you'll get better disciples. Something that just doesn't work. Will Mancini, in that same book, Future Church, he lists seven unintended messages of a culture of worship services rather than a culture of mission in a church. This is what seems to happen. Number one, church starts to become a place that you go, rather than being about being a family on mission everywhere. Church becomes just a part of your week, or a part of your month, or a part of your year, versus church being about being a family on mission every day. Church becomes a dispensary of services, a provider of religious goods and services, instead of being a productive community and a participatory community. Worship is for inspiration and enjoyment, versus worship is about pleasing God. Ministry becomes for professionals, versus ministry being the opportunity for every believer. Service means activities that keep the organisation running versus actions that kindly help one's neighbour. And an unbeliever's first contact with the church becomes about its largest programmed event versus it being about their relationship with a believing friend. Now, let's not be mistaken. Worship is important. Worship is vital. Worship is going to happen when you get to know Jesus. When you get to know Jesus, you just want, need to worship him. Worship is, in fact, so important that we want to get it right. So let me run an idea past you. This is the second point in your notes today. If you want to worship God, mission is where you start. If you want to worship God, mission is where you start. If you take a moment to think about Jesus' teaching, in what ways does Jesus teach his disciples to worship the Father? In what ways does Jesus teach his disciples to worship the Father? Jesus himself worships the Father in a very particular way. He does it by doing what the Father sent him to do. Have a look at John 17 verse 4. In Jesus' prayer to his heavenly Father, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. In order to glorify God, we must do the work that he sent us to do. John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. To put this in other words, the goal that Jesus has given us for today as his disciples, is to set about the mission that he has set for us. Because here's the thing, obedience is worship, isn't it? Obedience is worship. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me 
will obey my teaching. That's worship. Now, before we see how Jesus defined what mission is, let me remind you of something very important, a foundational understanding. The church puts mission first because God puts mission first. The reason that the upper room kind of church puts mission first is because it's obvious that God puts mission first. Do you remember what mission is? Mission is about making disciples and apprentices of Jesus, that they might start to live and experience the life of God, the eternal life of God. Remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, right back at the beginning of the Bible? It says, So God created humankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. So what does God do? God makes humankind as His apprentices. People made in His image, like Him, to do with Him what it is that He is doing in the universe. Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 1, verse 26 says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule, so that they may be a part of administering, loving, serving, caring for this world that has been created. Now, of course, we know that humanity did a rotten job of this. And the rest of the Bible outlines how God sets out on a mission to redeem humanity throughout the rest of history. But when God created the world, He did so with a particular mission in mind. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. God has always been on mission to bring us back to himself and to bring us to wholeness. When we understand God, not as the God who is just sitting back and absent from humanity and his universe, but the God who's involved, who is actually on mission to save people, to work in people's lives, to change the things that are going on, then we see that we could say that mission is not simply God's idea, mission is God's DNA. So it should come as no surprise that Jesus passes on that sense of mission and purpose to his disciples. In fact, that is what he's always been aiming towards, not simply making disciples, but making disciples who make disciples. That's the kind of disciples he's seeking to make. Making people who are on mission. And then the hope was that those disciples would then make disciples who would make disciples, who would make disciples who would make disciples. Now, I understand that this may sound a little bit intimidating. The idea that to be a disciple, you should be making disciples can sound very intimidating. But this is actually a more natural and easy way to live than trying to live as a disciple who doesn't make disciples. Because there's your two options. You can either be living on mission as a disciple who seeks to make disciples, or you can try to be a disciple who doesn't make disciples. A disciple who goes against the spiritual DNA of Jesus that has been planted within you. It's kind of like being a baker that doesn't bake. It's like being a Formula One driver who doesn't drive. It's like being a singer who doesn't sing. If you're a singer, if you call yourself a singer, you just have to sing, don't you? That's what showers are for. As a follower of Jesus, you were remade by Him to make followers of Jesus. That's the DNA of the Holy Spirit that has actually been placed in you. I used to call myself a basketballer, but not anymore because I don't play basketball. Sure, I think about it. I watch games. I still wear basketball boots occasionally. 
but the basketballer within me has died and shriveled up. I only find it fulfilling to ever call myself a basketballer when I have a basketball in my hand. If you don't engage in helping other people to follow Jesus, in all of those various forms, we're not talking about standing on the street corner, we're not talking about necessarily going and knocking on doors, not that those things can be bad, but they're often things, the ideas that intimidate us. But if we engage in just helping our neighbour, helping a person next to us to follow Jesus, then if we don't do that, you will find yourself dissatisfied about your relationship with God. You will find yourself unfulfilled with this idea of being a Christian. Following Jesus, apprenticing ourselves to him is not an idea, it's an action. Remember, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So here's point three. Worship happens when we become obedient partners with God in his mission. Worship actually happens when we become obedient partners with God in his mission. This is when we have a sense, a real sense of worshipping God. When we are participating in his will being done his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. Remember, the idea of the upper room is not that we simply live for Jesus, but that we're actually living with Jesus. This is no more evident than in what Jesus does with his disciples. We've already seen how Jesus sends his disciples out on mission in Matthew 28. But we've also seen this happening right at the start with his first cohort of disciples. So let me take you back to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. When morning came, Jesus called his disciples to him. So there's lots of people at this stage who are following Jesus. And he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Not because he didn't want those other people to follow him, but because if you're going to start something, you can only invest in so many. So Jesus invests in a few for the sake of the many who will then invest in others. So Jesus calls his disciples to him, chooses 12 of them, whom he designates apostles. Now, notice what he designates them. Apostles. The Greek word is very much the same, apostolos. It means sent ones, those who are sent. That word, apostolos, was often used outside of the Gospels, and outside of the New Testament, for an envoy or an ambassador, a person who's appointed to represent another, to speak on their behalf. I find it quite interesting, actually, to see that the top leaders of the Jesus movement are not called rulers, they're not called governors or directors or managers. They're actually people who haven't been given any authority of their own, but they've been sent out with a message of love and service, an invitation. So, these disciples spend three chapters watching Jesus go out and about in his mission of inviting people into the kingdom of God. Then in 9 verse 2, we read this, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal those who were ill. So, what do they do? Verse 6, they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. And they can do this because they have seen Jesus model it, teach them. And what he has taught them has been three things. He's taught them the mandate, the method and the manner of mission. So I wanted to remind you of those really quickly. Number one, the mandate is this, go and proclaim the kingdom of God and heal people. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God and heal people. That's what God sends us out on mission. If you're wondering, what does it mean to be on mission? This is what it means. This is the mandate. Go out, proclaim the gospel. So tell people about Jesus. Tell people about the life that God has for them. Tell them that God is available to them right here and right now and heal them. Now, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to tell them to take up their mat and walk But if God prompts you to do so, go ahead and do that. But most of the time, it's about bringing the healing of knowing a God 
who is loving and forgiving and patient and kind and has everything under control and tells us that we don't need to worry. It's about bringing that into other people's lives. It's about bringing the healing of being a loving, non-anxious, non-judgmental presence into someone else's life. Don't ever forget that being on mission means to proclaim the kingdom and to heal. And you can do that because the Holy Spirit is with you. Because here's the method. The method is through service. We serve people. God serves us. He fills us with the serving spirit. And then we serve other people. That is the manner. Sorry, the method of mission. It's service. What's the manner that we should have? It's humility and obedience. That's what mission's meant to look like. It's meant to look humble. It's when we obey Jesus and live the same way as him. So that is fairly straightforward. That's the kind of thing that we can do on our front line. We can do that in our home. We can do that in our workplace. We can do that wherever we are. And once Jesus has trained his disciples, he moves on to the last stage of his own mission. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we read this. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. But something happens. On his way towards Jerusalem, as he's um, travelling through Samaria, we read this. As the time came for him, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely sent out for Jerusalem. And as he does so, he comes across a group of Samaritans who oppose him because he's actually going to Jerusalem to worship the Jewish way at the Jewish temple instead of the Samaritan way. And so they tell him, we don't want you in our town. Well, when this happens, Jesus' response is to move on. But do you remember the response of two of his, his disciples? This is what they say, James and John, they say to Jesus, hey, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, no. Sometimes that's what we think mission is. Sometimes if someone opposes us, we think, right, I'll have you. We think we're meant to, fi we're meant to fix them, we're meant to set them straight, we're meant to oppose them. But having the culture of mission that Jesus sets us helps us to decide what to do in those moments. Because what is our mission? Our mission is, what's the mandate? To go. To go and preach and heal. It's to go, not to stop and fight with people who disagree with us. It's to proclaim the open door of the kingdom to people. It's not to slam it closed in their face. And our mission is to heal people, not blast them. What is happening here is described as mission drift. And we've got to recognise this. Mission drift happens where we think, yes, I'm going to serve Jesus, I'm going to obey Jesus, I'm going to follow him. Um, but then it starts to drift from what it was that he sent us. We can so easily drift when we feel more inclined to do our thing at a particular time when we're led by the currents of our emotions or our tribe's inclinations or the wider cultural influences, we can easily turn inwards. And that's precisely what the early church of Acts realised and had to resist. Not that the early church didn't have its problems, it had many problems, it did. That's why Paul writes his letters, that's why in Acts chapter 15 they hold a council because they had their own version of mission drift. What happened was that people started to drift back towards the Jewish laws and they started separating into old and new, contemporary and traditional. But it's important to see how they overcame this. Next point. We can't combat mission drift by a mission statement. We clarify it by a mission state of mind. Missions, statements can be good, they can help clarify things, but really what is needed is not simply a statement, but what lies behind that statement, which is a state of mind. And we need to have that state of mind. So let me talk you through that for a moment. When they had inner problems in the early church, they made sure that these didn't eclipse the original mission call to make disciples. Have a look at Acts chapter 6. 
In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this ministry over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Point four. A prayer and ministry of the word state of mind is the state of mind that we need. We need a prayer and ministry of the word state of mind. Now, when you hear that phrase, prayer and ministry of the word, what is it that you think of? I bet, I bet what you're thinking about is church. I bet that's what you think of. Because we often think of preaching and worship services and prayer on Sundays and small groups of Christians when we think of prayer and ministry of the word. But how did the book of Acts see prayer and ministry of the word? Where was it that the apostles preached? Do you remember where they preached? They preached in public. Acts chapter 5 verse 42 says, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Out in public. But it wasn't just the apostles that proclaimed the word there. Chapter 8 verse 4 to 5 says... Those who have been scattered, remember the apostles stayed in Jerusalem during this first persecution, but those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. What do the scattered do? What does Luke highlight? They do mission. They go and proclaim and heal. Philip's one of the scattered and when he no longer has access to the temple in Jerusalem... Does he go to the Samaritan temple to worship? No. He goes to the Samaritan time, towns to proclaim the gospel and heal. Now, the interesting thing is the phrase ministry of the word uses the same word as Acts chapter 12, verse 25 uses. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission. Now, in your English Bibles, this is probably the only place you'll find the word mission. Because in the New Testament world, their idea of mission was ex- really the idea of something else. The word was diakonia. And it's the word that's used for a deacon. It's the word that means service or ministry. So when Paul and Barnabas had min- finished their service, or ministry. So we could try change that, but we could do it the other way around too. So instead of thinking just of the ministry of the word, we could think of the mission of the word. Is mission of the word our state of mind as a church? And what about prayer? Where did they pray? They prayed in homes and they prayed in public. Acts chapter 3 verse 1, we hear this, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple in, at the time of prayer. Now, the time of prayer for a Jewish person was not a time when everyone in their seats would bow their heads and pray silently. People didn't pray silently. They didn't read silently. They would actually, when they read books, they would read out loud. If you were reading with your mouth closed, people would think you were a bit kooky. When you prayed, you, didn't, you, you prayed out loud. They prayed in public. What do they pray for? Acts chapter 4, verse 29 to 31. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. In Acts, prayer was for the sake of seeing people saved and healed. I'm not saying that next time you're on the train and you want to pray that you should burst out in a loud voice and pray. I'm not saying that, but recognising that prayer is not merely a private thing for our sake. Prayer is something for the sake of the public, for the sake of the world, for the sake of what it is that Jesus is doing in this world as well. Remember the mission Jesus sent his disciples out to do? Luke 9, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal those who were ill. Remember that there were 12 to start, but then it expanded. 
It wasn't just the 12, it became the task of every disciple. And chapter later in Luke 10, we hear this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of them, ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Heal those who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. What a fantastic picture there is in this passage. Did you notice what happened? It says Jesus sends out the 72. So it's not, not, not just the 12 now, it's the 72. But he sends them out to go to the places where he is going to go. What if our big role is to be going to places where Jesus is going to go? I mean, Jesus has already been there working, but the idea that we go to a place and we tell people the kingdom of God has come near to you, and as we share with them that, one day we have this hope that Jesus is going to open their eyes. Now, you may be starting to see that mission does appear to be the primary focus of God himself, and so too for us as his church. But you may also feel a rising level of concern about the very idea of mission for you. Because over the years, people have pointed us in different directions. Sometimes they have given us the idea that mission is actually about getting as many people onto our team as possible. Or it's to get people to agree with us. Or it's to win arguments. Or we go out on mission to stop people from doing bad things and instead be nice. Sometimes it's just about stopping people from going to hell. Or even lessening a sense of guilt in ourselves. But with Jesus, it's very simple. He says, I just want you to be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, Jesus says. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So let me close with this point, number five. Our mission is to live our life as a witness to the influence of Jesus. Our mission is to live our life as a witness to the influence of Jesus. You don't have to use the right words. You don't have to give the exact explanation. You don't have to have a theological justification for every point that you make. What you need is to tell people about your experience of Jesus. And we do this in our lifestyle. We give people every reason to see that God is real in our changed practices and our changed priorities. We explain that the positive outcomes in our life, peace and joy and hope of healing, have come from a relationship with Jesus and an alignment with his way to be human. We tell people what we know, that Jesus has changed us that he has changed the way things are, that he challenges the way that things are, that he actually gives another way forward for the way things are. He has shown us that there is a better way for us humans to be. Basically, we're inviting people to experience what we've experienced in Jesus. It's a mission of giving, not taking. It's really important to remember that about mission. It's not some form of Christian colonialization. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's actually, well, it's not even a funnel scheme. It's more of a fountain scheme where things gush forward from within us. We're not trying to take someone away from the world, away from their family, away from their job. It's not invasion of the Christian body snatchers. Cults may do that. We don't. Followers of Jesus don't. Jesus perfect, purposefully left his disciples in the world. Did you notice that? Jesus purposefully left his disciples in the world. Why? Because they were made for mission. So when we think of mission, we're not thinking about accomplishing a task as much as we're thinking about serving someone. And in, as in the case of the followers of Jesus, it's a dual service. It's serving Jesus and it's serving other people. 
What's actually happening is that we are introducing people to a whole new world, one where God will come into their life and overflow into the lives of others. Because here's the reality. Someone becoming a follower of Jesus is a gift to our world. If that man who picked up a knife at Bondi Junction became a follower of Jesus... It would be a gift to the world. If every person who has power and makes decisions selfishly for themselves became a follower of Jesus, that would be a gift to the world. But it's a particular kind of gift. It's not one that boosts this current worldview. It's one that actually turns it upside down or right way up. So, what we see is that God is on mission to bless the world. He has blessed the world through you. He has changed you and he's made you a different person. And you are blessing the world as a result. His desire is to continue to bless the world. Not simply externally, but internally. That people may know the joy and the hope that Jesus brings. That's the mission that God invites us into. Let's show him our love by doing what he tells us to do. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we recognise that you came into the world, not simply to say, hey, I'm here, worship me, but you came into the world to serve. The Son of Man came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you did that. And Jesus, we recognise that, that your life, the life that motivated you to do that, is the life that you place in us. When we start to follow you, you have given us a life that is like that. A life that is meant to be given away. A life that is made to serve. A life that thrives on giving instead of taking a life which really grows and deepens when we share with others the good things that we have, a life which begins to experience the depth of love when we actually show love in action to other people, a life where we are transformed and changed when we are willing to come into contact with your mind, when we are willing to listen to your words when we are willing to put them into practice and obey them. When we do these things, we discover that our life is changed. Lord Jesus, thank you that you gave your life for us. Once again, we want to repent. We want to say sorry for the way that we have lived our life. We want to say, Lord Jesus, would you make us clean and free? whether it's for the very first day today or whether it's a day among many days in our life. Lord Jesus, once again we pray, would you set us straight? Would you help us to live the kind of life that resonates with your life? We want to live a life of mission. So Lord, help us to see that that just as someone else came and they told us about the kingdom of God, they told us about Jesus, they explained to us how we could be made right with you, Thank you for the people who came and brought healing into our life, who taught us things that healed our way of thinking, that showed us the kind of love that healed our soul, that demonstrated the fact that we were not alone and did all of these things because you were the one who was working through them. Oh God, we want to be a part of that. Help us to be the kind of church and the kind of people who let people know about the good news and bring healing into their lives. We thank you, God, that you are worth following and worshipping with every action of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.